Welcome back everybody to another lecture here in History 1301. And today the topic that we will be covering is that of the secession crisis that begins to develop in late 1860 and early 1861. Now when we were last in lecture, we saw that following John Brown's raid, the nation was split like never before. Southerners were suspicious of Northerners, believing that their institution of slavery was under threat, and they believed that the outcome of the election of 1860 would determine whether or not the institution would live on or if it would die out. Now, as we enter this election year of 1860, it would prove to be America's most significant election, at least in its history up to this point. Now, the Democratic Party itself, following the events of John Brown's raid, would be completely shattered. Even though Stephen Douglas had tried to control both the northern and southern con contingents within the party, they slowly began to fall apart. Southern Democrats were outraged at Northerners, believing, as I had mentioned before in the previous video, that all Northerners in some fashion were targeting their institution of slavery. And when Douglas was presented as the Democratic nominee at the uh, Democratic National Convention, Southerners saw this as too much. And they would go off and hold their own convention to where they would select their own nominee. That of the current vice president at the time of the U or in the U.S. of John C. Breckinridge, and effectively this will split the Democratic vote, and there will be two Democratic uh, candidates on the ballot come November. Now, in the meantime, the Republican Party that had been newly formed in the previous decade, it was nowhere near as chaotic, and most Republicans were united in their effort to stop the expansion of slavery out into the West. And there were several individuals who could have became the Republican nominee in 1860. However, the one that would stand out above all others would be Abraham Lincoln, who had become basically a household name for his actions within the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and he would become the Republican nominee in 1860. In the meantime, though, there would be one more major candidate who would enter this election. In states like Kentucky, Tennessee, as well as Virginia, and many of the what are called the border southern states, there was a lot of discontent with both political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats alike. And most former Whigs would go off and form their own party, that of a union party, and they would uh, nominate as their candidate one John Bell. However, in the upcoming election, what's going to happen with four presidential candidates, it would create a divided election. But the election will be divided really along sectional lines, how the campaigns for each one of these candidates would be run. In the North, the main two individuals that would be voted upon and debated would be that of Lincoln and Douglas the Northern Democrat and the Northern Republican. Meanwhile, in the South, it would mainly be John C. Breckinridge and John Bell who would do the campaigning for their respective parties. And ultimately, this spells disaster in the long run because Lincoln will sweep the Northern states and by sweeping the Northern states, he would gain an effective majority enough to win the presidency, even though he doesn't win a majority of the popular vote. Now, when he's elected to office and when this becomes clear to Southerners, they believe that he was an abolitionist and that come day one, the institution of slavery would be dissolved. And Lincoln's election would prove to be the last straw. And by December 20th, 1860, the state of South Carolina, which had threatened disunion before during the nullification crisis and even during the Compromise of 1850, this would be their last straw. On December 20th, they would take that fateful step, establish an ordinance of secession and break away from the Union, effectively beginning the secession crisis. When South Carolina seceded from the Union, it would send shockwaves throughout much of the Union. And even President, or President-elect Lincoln at this time believed that it was merely just a bluff by the Southerners. However, nonetheless, it would bring about widespread uh, condemnation from all across the North. Namely, James Buchanan would condemn the issue of secession, stating that South Carolina constitutionally didn't have the right to do so. However, Buchanan, in a show of his weak leadership, would uh, also state that he believed that they were forced to this, not because of their own selfish means, but because of the abolitionists, and further argue on that the reason Southerners had, or further going on, stating that while he believed secession was illegal, he could do nothing about it. And slowly, with his inactivity, one by one, further states would follow in the footsteps of South Carolina. In the meantime, as South Carolina initially was its own, the only state to secede, they would begin to send out secession commissioners, which you'll read about in one of your uh, or one of the books for the semester here um, around the same time. 
Now, these secession commissioners, as you've read about, these were individuals sent out to places like Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, going to their special conventions to deliver rousing speeches with racially charged rhetoric to convince Southerners that the only way to protect slavery and protect the racial social order of whites on top and everybody else on the bottom was to secede and break away from the Union to form a new government that would protect this institution. One by one, by February 1st of 1861, there would be six other southern states that would join South Carolina. The states of Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas would all join South Carolina by February 1st. And three days after the last of those seven states agrees to this, that being Texas, we'd then see that there'd be fit, er, several delegates who would be sent off to a convention that was meeting in Montgomery, Alabama to establish a new government. And quickly, Using the U.S. Constitution as a model, there would be a new government that would be established, that of what would be dubbed the Confederate States of America. Now, the charge of most of these Southerners when they create this new government, they want to branch away from the federal government, and they would use rhetoric later on stating that they were merely trying to protect their state's rights. However, in reality, this government was founded upon the institution of slavery. As I mentioned before, they would virtually use the U.S. Constitution as a model. And the two noteworthy uh, differences between those two documents was, one, that the Southern president, who would be Jefferson Davis here soon, would only be allowed to serve one six-year term. And then the other major difference is no less than ten times there was a mention of the word slavery, something that before the 13th Amendment was not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. Not to mention, as this new government was being formed, whenever they do select their president and vice president, Davis's vice president, that of Alexander Stevens, would go out and say that the cornerstone of the Confederacy was to preserve that institution of slavery, to maintain the racial social order, to keep whites on the top, and have blacks viewed as inferior. And it will be this rhetoric that would serve the basis for the founding of the Confederate States of America. And it's very hard to argue against slavery being the issue to why these states formed a new nation. But nonetheless, regardless of why they formed this new nation, by March of 1861, as Lincoln was preparing to take office, it was clear that the Southerners were not bluffing. Even Lincoln himself, as he delivers the inaugural address, he realizes he must do something. And he makes it clear to Southerners that he was not intent on trying to end the institution of slavery. He even would, before this, back several efforts at compromise. Most notably, he would propose, or I shouldn't say he, but Republicans as well as Democrats would support a 13th Amendment that would protect slavery by federal law. However, it would be rejected. By March 5th, 1861, while he may have been trying to broker a peace deal to perhaps calm tensions, it became clear that he needed to take a stricter stance to maintain federal property that were in the, south, or that were in the uh, states in the South, like arsenals and forts. And on March 5th, 1861, the day after he takes his inaugural address and made it clear that he wanted to preserve the Union, he had delivered onto his desk a letter from one Major Robert Anderson, the commander at Fort Sumter. And over the course of the next month, the focus of both Northerners and Southerners would center around Fort Sumter and the few federal installations that were throughout the South, of whether or not Lincoln, unlike Buchanan, would stand up and make sure they remained in federal hands or if he'd hand it over to the Confederates. Now, Lincoln, he made it clear. He was determined to maintain Fort Sumter. However, just as determined as he was to resupply Fort Sumter and ensure that it did not fall into Confederate hands, Jeff Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy were just as determined to make sure that it fell into their hands. And tensions continued to mount. No peace deal would be brokered. The fort would not be handed over to the Confederates. And on April 9, 1861, Jefferson Davis and his cabinet would issue special orders to one PGT Beauregard, who was a commander of the Confederate batteries in Charleston, South Carolina, where Fort Sumter was at, saying that if the fort did not surrender before the arrival of U.S. Uh, sub, or resupplies from, from Washington, that he was to open fire on the fort and force it to surrender. He would reach out across the void and ask Major Robert Anderson to surrender the fort. However, Anderson would refuse to. On April 12th, in the early morning hours, what would begin would be a 36-hour-long bombardment of Fort Sumter, to where guns from all across Charleston Harbor opened up on the fort. Now, in the end, there would only be three individuals who had died, and it was because of a cannon exploding. However, don't let this bloodless initial battle that lasted 36 hours foreshadow events to come. Because effectively, when Fort Sumter surrenders on April 14th, 1861, 
Lincoln saw this as an act of war. And the following day, he would call for the raising of 75,000 troops, and with it looked to suppress the Southern Rebellion, to show leadership that Buchanan had lacked. However, tensions will only continue to mount, and over the course of the next four years, over 750,000 Americans are going to die in the Civil War. But we'll talk about the events of the Civil War when we meet in lecture next time. But anyways, that brings us to an end of our discussion over the secession crisis. Now we're perfectly set up to go into a discussion of the American Civil War. But anyways, before we leave, just like always, if you are... If you have any outstanding assignments, if you uh, haven't read the chapter in the textbook and if you're missing and you haven't read any of the readings, make sure you do all of that. Get that done as soon as possible, but otherwise everybody go out, be safe, I'll see you all next time.